Hello and welcome to ICAW Law. This is chapter number one, which looks at contract formation. But before we actually get stuck into the, the main meat and bones of contracts, just a couple of little comments. What's going to happen is we're going to go through all the various different slides and we're going to have a commentary around the outside, which will explain to you in more detail exactly what these different issues are. Every now and again, I'll make a comment to you to say, this looks like it's very examinable. Every time you see a list of things, it means it's potentially going to be a multi-choice question. That gives you an idea of what's going on. What also happens is within your study manual, you have worked examples and interactive questions. What you'll tend to find is I don't use an awful lot of those within these recordings because what I'll actually do is talk to you about the cases where the interactive questions and the worked examples are actually based upon. So I'll tell you about the real life law situation. And then when you go back and have a look at the study manual, you'll go click. Oh, yeah, I remember that course and the case that was then discussed. So hopefully that will make some sense. Now, within this first chapter, so within this first chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the formation of contracts. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the validity of a contract and we're going to look at the various different component parts which have to be in place for a contract to actually exist, which means we're looking at four different things. Here's a multi-choice question straight away. Offer, acceptance, intention and consideration. So there's four different things we need to have for a valid contract to be formed. Offer, acceptance, intention, and then consideration. And we're going to go through each of these one at a time. There are other component parts, other things which have to be in place for a contract to work, but these are the four key areas. Now, contract, from a legal perspective, is a civil law issue. And it's actually based on a relationship that two parties have voluntarily decided to engage in. Now, the way I'm actually wording that is really important. So it's based on two parties voluntarily wanting to get involved in a relationship. If something goes wrong in this type of civil law situation, and a big focus here on civil law, we don't want to punish anybody. What we are looking to do is compensate the injured party. And when I start looking at remedies, which is the legal phrase, which means solution to a problem. So when I'm looking at remedies, one of the things I'm looking at is actually giving people a remedy to a civil law situation, which is based on compensation. So my ultimate objective with this type of relationship is to encourage economic growth. But there is a downside here. If it doesn't work for whatever reason, we have a way of dealing with it. And that's the remedies which will normally be damages, which equals compensation. It's not, pun it's not designed to be punitive. So it's not designed to be punitive. Now, we'll start off with a definition of what a contract is. Uh, the definition of a contract focuses in on the idea of an agreement which legally binds the different parties. It's got to be between parties who voluntarily want to engage in this type of relationship, which is why we say it must be consenting minds. Parties are judged on what they have said and what they have done, which means that contracts do not have to be in writing. So contracts do not have to be in writing. You can have oral or verbal contracts where people have agreed something and I will determine as the court whether or not there's a contract there by what people have said to each other and then what they have done. Now, what we're going to do within this contract area of the syllabus is we're going to look at the three main areas of contract. And we're going to look at formation within this chapter. We're going to have a look at terms and conditions within this chapter as well. In the next chapter, chapter number two, we start to then look at breaches and remedies. So we're looking at formation here and then we'll get into terms and conditions. That terms and conditions then allows me to roll into chapter two, looking at breaches of terms and conditions and warranties. And that will now give me a better understanding of the different solutions potentially available. Now, for a contract to exist, we need to have four key essential elements. And the courts will always look for these four key essential elements to determine whether a legally binding relationship is in place and whether a contract was actually engaged in. And if a contract is engaged in, it now means that we can do something from a remedies perspective. So when something goes wrong, we can find a solution. These are our four key essential elements. There are other elements which are important, but not quite as important as these. And what we've got is other requirements, which includes things such as capacity. So some people will have restricted capacity. They may have restricted capacity because they're not in full control of their mental faculties. You may find that people have restricted capacity because of their age. So if somebody is deemed to be 
under the age of 18 years, so if somebody is under 18 years, or if somebody is not of sound mind, they do not have sufficient capacity. Now, this sufficient capacity may come about because you are drunk. So if you are drunk, and you may be in a situation whereby somebody's trying to engage you in a contract, you may not have capacity. It depends. It's all a little bit fluffy. It gets wonderfully grey. Some contracts have to be in a specific form. The historic example of this was land. Historically, land contracts had to be in writing. Now they can be electronic. But contracts for land cannot be verbal. We need to have something down to say exactly what's going on. And what we also have is this idea of voluntarily engaging in this type of legally binding agreed agreement says that it must be genuine consent. Now, genuine consent means that I want to do something, which means there's no undue influence or duress. So duress is basically somebody trying to force me to do something that I don't want to do. So duress will come about because somebody's holding a knife to my throat. So when you see these random films where people are being forced to sign a contract because there's a gun to their head, that would not be a voluntarily arrangement a voluntarily agreed arrangement, therefore, that would not be a valid contract. Also, within certain contracts, the content, so the content, will sometimes be written down as an express term. However, some terms are automatically implied by statute. Some terms can be implied by the way that you have acted with those parties in previous dealings. And we're going to come across quite a few of these issues when we start looking at cases like Hillis and Arcos. Legality, if you've got a contract which is illegal or against public policy, so for instance, Colombian talcum powder importers, we're probably not going to allow that because it looks like it's some sort of illegal narcotic. Now, before we start getting into what good contracts are and how to form the good contract, you need to have an understanding of what a bad contract is or when a contract doesn't really exist. This type of thing comes up in your exam all the time. So the next three issues with different types of key terms, very, very important. The first one is when we have a void contract. Now, a void contract is not a contract at all. A void contract will come about if there is an illegal agreement, so an illegal agreement, or an agreement which goes against public policy. That means there's no contract. That means nobody can enforce anything because there's no contractual relationship there at all. Next, what we have is a voidable contract. Now, a voidable contract will potentially come about where we have misrepresentation or duress exerted on one party to enter into the contract. So if you have misrepresentation, so somebody's basically lied to you to encourage you to enter into this type of contract, or you've had additional influence or pressure, we call that duress, exerted upon you to enter into the contract. In this type of situation, then you have the ability to avoid the contractual obligations. So you can avoid it. The other party who's entered into it properly, they can't necessarily avoid it. This can also potentially come about because of a lack of capacity, such as being under 18 years. So avoidable contracts can come about because of a lack of capacity. So contracts involving minors under 18 years here. An unenforceable contract, which is the third term, which is really important to me, is a valid contract. So it's a valid contract. However, the contract has been done potentially in the wrong format or in the wrong form, such as an agreement to transfer land or some sort of guarantee for a loan, which is not in the correct format. It's not in writing. It's maybe a verbal agreement. In that type of situation, so in that type of situation, it's unenforceable, which means that one of the two parties cannot force the other one to fulfill their obligations. So one party cannot force the other one to fulfill their obligations. And what happens here, as I've said, is probably because the contract is not in the required form. So what happens here is we're going to end up with some sort of breach issue. So we have to end up going to the courts potentially. Now, let's get into the proper meat and bones of actually getting this contract set up. We've got four different things we need to look at. Offer, acceptance, consideration, and then intention. Offers for a contract is a definitive promise to be bound on specific terms. It's me saying I'm prepared to be bound on these terms and I will put no more extra terms in place. This offer will stipulate the specific conditions 
I am happy to engage in this contract with you. So the offer will give me the specific conditions that I'm prepared to enter into the contract with you. These are the specific conditions that will form the meat and bones of my contract. Now, what this means is we have got specific things which have got to be in place within the offer. The things that have got to be in place within the offer include, number one, an unequivocal statement that I'm prepared to be engaged in contractual relations with you. It must be clear and unambiguous. So it must be clear and unambiguous. A willingness to be bound on specific terms without any further negotiations because I've given you all of the terms and conditions. So I've given you all of the terms and conditions within my offer. The offer must be communicated from me, who's the person who will be the offeror, who's the person making the offer, to you who receives the offer being the offeree. So the person who makes the offer is the offeror with an OR at the end. The person that receives it is the offeree with a double E at the end of it. Think about it as employer and employee. The employer makes you an offer of employment. The employee then decides whether or not to accept it or not. Now, this offer has got to be communicated. And we're going to look at this in a lot of detail. What happens with this communication? The communication does not have to be in writing. The communication can potentially be a verbally communicated offer. So it can be a verbally communicated offer. Or it can potentially be in writing. Or, remember, the courts will look at what we've said and what we have done. So it might be conduct. So it might be what we've actually done on a day-to-day -day basis or what we've done with this specific relationship to force the relationship to exist as a contractual relationship. Now, this type of offer can be made to a particular person or to a group of people or to the whole wide world. Now, make a little love note here, please, guys. When we come to Carbolic Smokeball Company and little old lady, Mrs. Carlyle, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you about the specifics of the case that relates to a case now where the offer was made to the entire world. Now, we're going to come to that case a little bit later on. It's a really, really important case. It focuses in on lots of different issues with regards to contract law. It's one of these key cases that you will end up learning. You're not, not expected to learn the case names. But what I would say to you is, as we go through cases, do try to learn the stories behind them. They are actually really important. And if you are trying to learn some of these cases, what you can actually do is write down on a little card, like a library card, uh, you can write down the name of the case on one side and have the details on the other. You can then get your better half to come and test you, which means that they don't feel left out as you're studying. Now, an offer, when we make the offer, has to be distinguished from everything else. We've got a supply of information, a statement of intent, and then we've also got an invitation to treat. We have to have an understanding of what these other things are and why they are not offers. So we'll start off by having a look at an invitation to treat. This invitation to treat is amazingly examinable. You are definitely going to get something on an invitation to treat. Now, an invitation to treat is where I invite you to make me an offer. So I invite you to make me an offer. This is not me making you an offer. So this is not me making you an offer. It has to be distinguished from an offer because an offer can now be accepted. If I make an invitation to you to make me an offer, that's not me making you an offer. That's me saying to you, I want you to make me an offer that you think is reasonable. And then we can start negotiating from that basis. I am not making an offer. Therefore, you cannot accept my offer. Now, some examples of this include advertisements. And what happens here is we have Partridge and Crittenden. This is actually quite a cool little case name because Partridge is all about selling um, brambling bird eggs. And what happens is Crittenden actually put an advert in the local paper saying that um, brambling bird eggs were for sale and he, he put a price down of it's a couple of shillings per, per couple of eggs. And what happened was Partridge actually worked for the RSPB, the Royal Society for Perfection of Birds, and he, they took action against Crittenden saying, you are trying to sell these birds, that is an illegal activity. The court said that the advert was an invitation for somebody else to make him an offer. Therefore, the advert itself because the way it was worded was not an offer. So the advert that you see in the paper to potentially sell something is not an offer. That's an invitation for you to make an offer to the person trying to sell it. Pharmaceutical Society of GB and Bart Boots Pharmaceutical Company, that is Boots the Chemists. What happens here is the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain had specific rules which said that any type of pharmaceuticals had to be sold by a dispensing chemist. 
Boots have got large shops where you can go in and pick up various different bits and pieces and then pay for them wherever you want to at any of the tills. The Pharmaceutical Society said that Boots were breaching their rules because they were offering to sell goods to people that were pharmaceutical products and they were not being offered to be sold to them by licensed pharmacists. Boots the chemist said, well, what we're doing when we put things on a shelf with a price by the side of it is we are inviting people to make us an offer. So that's an invitation to treat. And the courts agreed with them. So the customer makes the offer when they get to the till. The, the chemist itself, so Boots the chemist, they actually accept the offer when they say yes and then take the money from you. So the pharmaceutical society lost that. And what this now means is if you look at going to a shop to buy something, the management of the shop always have the right to say, no, you can't have that item. So shopkeepers can always say no because there's no valid contract because you are making the offer. So that now means that if there are restricted items such as um, alcoholic products or tobacco based products, the shopkeeper can say no and they're not breaching any type of contractual issues, which is wonderful. Um, with Fisher and Bell, what happened was there was a knife in a shop window with a sign by the side of it saying five pounds and that was potentially against the Offensive Weapons Act because he's trying to make a sale of a knife. Now, Bell actually said, I've got a knife in my window with a price by the side of it, inviting somebody else to come and treat. So somebody else is invited to make me an offer. Therefore, he's not offering to sell it. Therefore, Bell was not in breach of the Offensive Weapons Act. Now, what we have with regards to these offers is it's not an invitation to treat. And one of the key examples we look at with regard to invitations to treat is the idea of an advertisement normally, normally being an invitation to treat. Now, you remember I said, make, make sure you look out for Carlil and Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. Mrs. Carlil is our little old lady, the defenseless little lady who has decided to um, take legal action against somebody because they're doing something which is not appropriate. Now, what happens here is the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company, they make smoke balls. The Carbolic Smoke Ball Company put an advert in the paper saying, if you use our smoke balls and you still catch influenza, we guarantee, that's the word that changed everything, we guarantee to pay you £100. Mrs. Carlyle took the smoke balls, she used them, so her actions actually showed that she accepted the contract. So if Carbolic Smoke Ball Company make an offer, she's now accepted it. She then got the flu and she took action against them and said, I want my £100. Carbolic Smoke Ball Company says, oh, no, no, we've seen these cases before. We know what's going on with Partridge and Crittenden. Therefore, this is an invitation to treat. The courts looked at the wording of the advert and the court said, you guarantee. Therefore, the way you've worded it is an offer, which means it can now be accepted by somebody else. This actually brings up some other interesting aspects. This now means that the offer made by the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company was made to a huge number of people and that offer was communicated in the press. What also now happens is Carlyle and the other people who have now used the smoke balls have actually shown their acceptance through their actions. So this type of universal offer, so this type of universal offer was accepted through actions and those actions did not have to be communicated to the offeror. So there's quite a lot of little issues in here. There's quite a cool case, which is why I say it's one of the cases that you'll definitely learn. So in this situation, it was found that it was an offer to the world at large. It was what we call a universal offer. So anybody was potentially allowed to come along and accept it. So anybody was allowed to come along and accept it. Now, the next thing we need to make sure that we understand is an offer is not just a statement. So a statement of selling price is not an offer. So what we have is we get some very strange cases here where members of the same family get upset with each other. So with Harvey and Facey, what happens here is the claimant has asked the defendant for the minimum price he would accept to sell his property. And the defendant says, oh, yes, I would accept 100 guineas for this property. And then the other party, the person who's actually asked for the information says, ah, sold. Yes, I'll buy it for 100 guineas. And then Facey says, I haven't agreed to actually sell it to you for 100 guineas. I, I think... I want to keep this thing, this property. Therefore, I, I've not made you an offer. So that type of request for information and the fulfillment of that information is not, is not an offer. It's simply an invitation to treat. So how much do you think your car's worth, Ed? Well, I think my car's worth £5,000. Right, I will now offer you £5,000. It's up to me whether I accept that offer or not. 
So when I give you that information, I'm still making a type of invitation to treat. Also, a statement of intent to do something is not the same as doing something. And what happened with Harrison Nickerson is we've got an auction. And the auction was advertised as having certain goods available to be sold on the night. And the advert's goods did not appear on the night of the auction. Harris got upset and took action against the auctioneer, Nickerson, and said these things were supposed to be available to be sold. The court said, well, whether they were or not is irrelevant because there's no contract. Nickerson has not made an offer that you can now accept. What happens is Nickerson has made a statement of intent to say, I intend to put these things up for sale, but he may have changed his mind. And that's within his purview. He can change his mind if he wants to. So make sure you're happy with what an offer is and what an offer isn't. All of these cases could quite happily come up as a two mark question. So here's a situation. Is there a contract? Yes, no. And here's some reasons why yes or no. Now, once I make an offer, so once I make an offer, it can potentially be accepted. If it's accepted, then we have a contractual relationship. If, if it hasn't been accepted, then I can potentially terminate it. And there are four different ways I can potentially terminate an offer. Four different ways. That sounds like a multi-choice question to me. There we go. There's another multi-choice question which can come up. Four different ways of terminating the offer. And we're going to go through these one at a time to make sure you're completely comfortable with it. The first thing is we could have a counter offer. So the first thing we can do is have a counter offer. Now with a counter offer, when I make my offer, the acceptance of that offer must be an unqualified acceptance. If you come back and you add in extra terms, that now means that you have rejected my initial offer and you're now making a new offer. So if I say to you, I would like to, I would like to buy your car for 5,000 pounds and you go, I don't know about 5,000 pounds, how about five and a half thousand pounds? That now means that you've rejected my £5,000 offer and you're now making a counter offer. And that's what happened within Hide and Wrench. The counter offer terminates the original offer. So the counter offer terminates the original offer. This counter offer, which is now a new offer, can now be accepted. So the counter offer, so the counter offer can now be accepted. Okay? The second way we can terminate this offer is if we have revocation by the offeror. Now, revocation means that I change my mind. So revocation means that I change my mind. I can change my mind as long as the offer has not been accepted. So I can change my mind as long as the offer has not been accepted. If it's been accepted, we now have a contract. I can't revoke my offer. I can't take it back after it's been accepted. Even if I make a promise to you to keep it open until a week on Thursday, as a for instance, in that situation, I can still change my mind. So even though I make a promise to keep it open, you haven't given me any consideration for that promise. Therefore, you can't enforce it because it's not a contract. Cross-reference that through to consideration later on, which means I can now change my mind. The revocation, so me withdrawing my offer, will only be effective when I tell the person I've made the offer to. So the revocation is only effective once I've told you that I'm not prepared to be engaged in this contract with you anymore. The communication does not have to come from me. So the communication does not have to come from me. The communication is allowed to come from, this is a key phrase, a reliable third party. So the communication can come from me or can come from a reliable third party. So that's the revocation. So we've had counter offer, revocation. Next, we're going to have rejection by the offeree. And the rejection by the offeree means that the person we've made the offer to has now said, no, I don't want that. And what we can have is a counter offer, such as with Hide and Wrench. And Hide and Wrench said that if you have this type of counter offer, you automatically reject the original offer. So if you have a counter offer, you automatically reject the original offer. And if that happens, the original offer is now destroyed. But you do have to be careful here because if you have a situation whereby the other party is asking for extra information, for instance, how long can I pay this amount over, such as in Stevenson and McLean, 
what now happens is that request for further information is not a counter offer. So if I had a situation whereby um, we are actually going to buy some, some coal and the coal is going to be purchased at 40 shillings per tonne and what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you to actually pay the 40 shillings. If you then come back to me and say, can I pay that 40 shillings over the next two months, which is the case of Stevenson and McLean, if I then reply to you and say, yes, then that's fine. If I don't reply to you, that does not mean I'm allowed to sell the coal to somebody else because you asking for specific information as to when the money has to be paid is a request for further information. It is not a counter offer. So that is not a counter offer. And that's really important to me. The fourth way we can kill off this offer is through the lapse of time. And what happens is the offer will be open for a specific amount of time, if that's what I put within the offer, or it will lapse after a reasonable period of time. Now, the definition of reasonable is a little bit fluffy, it's a little bit vague, and it depends upon the subject matter that the contract will cover. So within Ramsgate and Montefiore, what happened was the defendant applied to the company in June for shares and paid a deposit for those shares. So he's actually put the money down in June with a deposit. At the end of November, the company then sends him acceptance by issue of a letter of allotment and requests payments of the balance due. The defendant has now decided that, you know what, this has gone on for far too long. I don't want to pay the extra money. It actually turns out Ramsgate Victoria Hotel is about to fall over insolvently and they just needed to get as much money in as they possibly could. And the courts heard this and said, yeah, the offer was open there for a reasonable period of time only and five months is much more than a reasonable period when it comes to shares. Therefore, the offer that Montefiore had made to Ramsgate Victoria Hotel to buy some shares in it had lapsed and they had to repay his deposit. Now, what that means is with shares, five months is too long. When you get to the, the, the chapter on companies and finance, what you'll find is with shares, two months is the period of time within which you've got, you've got to actually submit the new share certificate or accept that person onto the register of members. So five months is way, way, way too long. So that's the idea of offer. So that's our idea of offer. Next, what we have is acceptance. And with regard to acceptance, we've got the definition of offer, which is an unequivocal, unambiguous statement. What we've got with acceptance is an unequivocal statement or act that this person is prepared to be unconditionally bound by the terms contained within the offer. Now, I'll focus on this again because it's really important. The person is prepared to be unconditionally bound by the terms within the offer. That means nothing else gets added. So if I make you an offer, you either accept it or you don't. There's no in-betweenies. The acceptance can potentially be in words. It can potentially be written down. It can potentially be actions. And the court will look at words and actions to determine whether or not acceptance has taken place. As a general rule, and this is why we've got Carlyle again, as a general rule, if you do have acceptance, you're expected to communicate it to the offeror. So you're expected to tell the person making the offer, so you're expected to tell the person making the offer that this is me accepting it. If you don't do that, acceptance is not communicated. It means that there probably, probably will not be a contract. However, there's exceptions. The exception here is if you have a universal offer. With a universal offer, such as Carlyle and Carbolic Smokeball Company, that type of universal offer, Mrs. Carlyle accepted the offer of the Carbolic Smokeball Company that they put into the newspapers by her actions, by actually purchasing the smokeballs and then using them. So that did not have to be communicated. So the general rule there, we've got our first exception already. Now, acceptance may potentially be stipulated in the original offer. So you may find that the offer specifically states that you must accept it in a specific way. Now, what happens is when you decide to accept it, you're not limited just to that way of doing it. You can do it that way or any other way which is just as expeditious. So you can do it that way or any other way which is just as expeditious. And what happened here with Brogdon and Metro Rail was we didn't have a written agreement for, with regard to coal deliveries, but the conduct was enough to infer acceptance of a draft agreement. So we drafted up an agreement and then we've started dealing with the other party on the basis of that agreement. 
Therefore, the agreement is effectively accepted because of conduct. So because of conduct. So maybe I didn't sign on the, the dotted line, which is what happened with Brogdon and Metro Rail. And what happens now is the court says, yeah, you didn't sign, but you carried on as though the, the contract was in place as per those terms and conditions. Also, what we have with regard to acceptance, silence is never consent. So silence is never consent. And what happens here is the case of Feltes and Bindley, which is wonderful. And what happens is we have an uncle who goes to his, ne his nephew. I would like to buy this horse from you. How much would you be prepared to accept for this horse? Um, and nothing came back. Right. He then went back to his nephew and says, I will buy this horse from you for 100 guineas. If I don't hear to the contrary, I will consider the horse mine. And the nephew just ignored him. The uncle then tries to take action to take the horse from the nephew. And the court says, but he has to have a positive act to, to show acceptance. So there has to be a positive act to show that there is an element of acceptance. No positive act equals no acceptance. Positive act can be words or conduct, but there must be something there. So there must be something there. If there's nothing there, then there's no contract in place. Now, the next thing we need to focus in on is an area that we have touched on already, which is communication. Communication of acceptance is almost always essential. We've got the Carbolic Smokeball Company as the exception. But apart from that, we need to make sure that we have the acceptance actually communicated. The way that you communicate, so the way that you communicate your acceptance may be stipulated within the contract itself. So the way that you actually communicate acceptance may be stipulated within the offer itself. And if you communicate that way, then that's fine. If you find a better way, so a more expeditious fashion of doing it, then that's okay as well. Then that's okay as well. And we've got a couple of situations which are fairly old cases because we look at telexes and faxes being used. And a telex is basically just a, a telecommunications function. It's like a text, but it's an old fashioned text. Um, and a text was asked as the way that you had to confirm that this kept, that this contract will be in place and somebody replied by fax. It's still fine. It's still completely okay. We've got another exception to this. So our first exception to this rule was the Carbolic Smokeball Company because that wasn't communicated at all. The second exception is known as the exception of the postal rule, which is the rule in Adams and Linsdale. Now what happens here is where the use of, this, of the post, i.e. the snail mail, is within the contemplation of both parties, what happens is you make an offer to me and you say to me, I'm happy for you to put your response in the post. As soon as I write down that I accept your offer and I stamp that envelope and I properly address it, the acceptance is communicated as soon as I put that letter in the post box. So the acceptance is communicated as soon as I put the letter in the post box even though you may get lost in the post completely. That's just tough. That's the rule in Adams and Linstall. And that is very specifically only applicable to the snail mail, to the postal service. Okay? And even though it might never reach the person who's made the offer, that's just tough. And that's what happened with Household Fire and Grant. Now, Grant applied for shares in Household Fire. Acceptance was sent by post, but never actually received. Household Fire then went bankrupt, and the liquidator sued Grant for the extra money they had to pay for the shares. And because the postal rule was in place, both parties expected or contemplated that the post would be used to communicate. Therefore, Household Fire accepted Grant's offer to buy shares as soon as Household Fire put that acceptance into the postal system. Therefore, Grant had to pay for those extra, extra amounts of cash for the extra calls on his shares. That's quite nasty the way that works. Now, there are ways around this because what you can now say, and most companies will say, if you've got to submit some sort of documentation, acceptance is not communicated until we've actually gone through and said that we're happy to accept you. So what they do is now companies will tend to make an invitation to treat to us and then they will accept our offer later on. Also, you may find that acceptance will only be uh, communicated upon receipt of a signature. That means the postal rule is being circumvented to some extent. Now, for the postal rule to work, the envelope has to be properly stamped, properly addressed. The postal system, so the postal system has to be, has to be in the reasonable contemplation of both parties. So using the post has to be within the reasonable contemplation of both parties. That's really important to me, really important. 
Other issues that we have with the communication, and this actually finishes off acceptance. So the last issue that we have with regard to communication is with unilateral contracts. And we've seen this already to some extent with Carlyle and Carbolic's Mobile Company. So I don't want to go back into that again because I think we've covered it sufficiently. Okay, the next thing that we have. So we have offer, we have acceptance. Next, we have intention to create legal relations. The intention to create legal relations shows that both parties, that both parties want to be engaged in a legally binding relationship. So both parties want to be engaged in a legally binding relationship. And what we have is two presumptions, but these presumptions can be binned. We say that they can be rebuttable. So we have two rebuttable presumptions. And the two rebuttable presumptions are always our starting point when we're trying to work out whether or not you wanted to create legally binding relations. Now, the first rebuttable presumption is if you have an agreement with somebody where you have a social, domestic or a family relationship, we presume that you do not want to create a legally binding relationship. Also, if you have some sort of agreement with somebody who you don't have that type of relationship with, then it looks like it's a commercial agreement, then you do want to create a legally binding relationship. So that's our two rebuttable presumptions. They're both of our starting positions. In both of these situations, you can have a situation, so in both of these rebuttable presumptions, you can have a situation whereby we ignore it or we bin it, which will rebut the presumption. We need to see evidence to show that that presumption can be rebutted. So you need to have evidence to show that this can now be rebutted. That's really important for me. The next thing we have, so we have offer, we have acceptance, we have intention. Next, we have consideration. And the idea of consideration is the element of value. Value must pass in both directions. So value must pass in both directions. Both parties must give something up. It's very unusual to see some sort of contract where both parties are not giving something up. An example of this would be a speciality contract, such as a deed, where a novation is given, which means it's some sort of agreement or value is being passed in a different way. So it's a deed of novation. You don't need to know about those things. So don't worry about the deed of novation. You don't need to know about it within contract at all. What will happen is we'll touch on it when we get to companies and their incorporation and promoters and such. Now, Dunlop and Selfridge came up with lots of different examples of definitions of, of parts of contract, which is why it's such a wonderful case. We do come across this quite often across quite a lot of the different areas of contract. And what we have is a definition here of consideration. It's an act, so it's something you're going to do, or forbearance, so something that you're not going to do. So not enforcing a right would be a forbearance, which means that you're giving value to somebody else by not taking something from them, potentially. And it's the promise of what's going to happen. It's the promise of value being transferred from one party to the other. So it's the promise of value being transferred from one person to another. You must have consideration passing in both directions. If we don't have consideration passing in both directions, we do not have a contract. And Curie and Misa came up with a slightly different definition, all about rights, interest, profit, or a benefit accruing to one person, and then a forbearance, detriment, loss, or responsibility given by the other one. So both parties will give something potentially different. So both parties can give something different. We don't have a problem with that. We're totally comfortable with it. As long as there's some sort of benefit there to the other party, I'm happy with that. So my forbearance, as long as that gives you some sort of value or some sort of benefit, then that's fine. Now, consideration can be executed or executory. If it's executed, so if it's executed consideration, this is an act in return for a promise. Executory is a promise for a promise. So executed says, I will do something now and you promise to pay me in the future. Executory is... I promise to do something in the future and you promise to pay me in the future. So a promise for a promise is executory. A promise for an act will be executed. The other interesting rule with regard to consideration is consideration cannot be in the past. So consideration cannot be in the past. And what this now means is the act or forbearance must be now, 
for executed consideration or in the future to be executory consideration. So consideration must be executed, I am going to do it now, or executory, I promise to do it in the future. It cannot be in the past. And the example we have there is Ray McArdle. Husband and wife lived with their mother, or with his mother it was. The wife completed some improvements on the house and the husband's brothers and sisters said that they would repay her for the time and effort that she put in upon the death of the mother. The mother unfortunately then died and the brothers and sisters refused to pay as the improvements were done prior to the promise the improvements were seen to be consideration given in the past. Therefore, there was no consideration given by the, the wife who actually, actually performed all the work on the house. That's just one of those things. Also, you could say that the rebuttable presumptions of the intention to create legal relations wasn't there either because you had a situation where there was definitely a family relationship. Now, there is an exception to this. There's always an exception to this. The exception is if there's going to be a commercial arrangement. So the exception here is there's an implied promise to pay if this is a commercial situation. So there's an implied promise to pay if this is a commercial situation. And with cases patents, what happens is you expect people to have to pay for the use of a patent. Therefore, using the patent would then incur some sort of cost. And that, that's really what's happened. And the person didn't want to pay it. Now, we have other issues with regard to consideration. This is a really important area of the syllabus. So with regard to consideration, what we can now say is consideration has to be executed or executory, cannot be in the past. Consideration has to be valuable and sufficient. So consideration must be sufficient. So that act or forbearance must be worth something. We do not need to work out exactly how much is is worth so we do not need to work out exactly how much it is worth as long as there is value there then that's fine and dandy and with chapel and nestle what happened is nestle had an offer whereby if you eat a certain number of chocolate bars and send in the wrappers with postage they will send you a free cd the, the guy chapel said that nestle are effectively buying all of these cds and then selling them off i would like my royalties paid Nestle said, you can have 10% of all the chocolate wrappers we've received. And the courts agreed. Because what they said was the contract that Nestle have engaged in is for chocolate wrappers to be sent in as the consideration. Therefore, the consideration is sufficient, even though it's not really worth an awful lot. So it's not adequate because it's well below the market value of the CD, but there is an element of value in there. Now, we've got other issues with regard to insufficient consideration. Insufficient consideration is when consideration is not enough and the contract will now fail. So insufficient consideration will, me will mean that the contract will fail. Such as in Thomas and Thomas, we had a situation whereby a house was let out, was actually let out to a widow for a rent of one pound a year. And it was found that that one pound a year is sufficient, even though it wasn't adequate, it's sufficient Therefore, the contract was in place and binding. This is when one of the kids was trying to kick out his, his, his mother from the home, which doesn't seem particularly nice anyway. A really interesting case, and I throw this in for comedy value, with white and blue it. Yeah, this actually ended up in court, which seems nuts. A son's promise to stop complaining doesn't amount to consideration as it has no value. That was obviously um, determined by a judge who's got no kids. Also, other issues. These next couple of cases are really important. These next two cases can come up together really nicely in a scenario. And they come up with a different outcome depending upon the level of people that are going to change their actions. If you have got the performance of an existing legal or contractual obligation or a statutory obligation. So a performance of an existing legal or statutory or contractual obligation. That is not an act or forbearance. You've got to do that anyway. That will be insufficient consideration. With Still Comiric, what happens is we have a situation whereby two crew members go AWOL when they're on, on tour, effectively. The captain promised those two crew members' pay would be paid to the remaining crew if they got the boat home. They got the boat home and the remaining crew says we want their pay as a bonus. The captain says you have not performed any actions over and above your normal duties and responsibilities and the court agreed with him. The court said that there was an existing contractual duty which the crew had performed. So there was no further consideration from the sailors. Therefore, the captain did not have to pay. So two, two crewmen go AWOL. No extra amount has to be paid. 
compare this case with Hartley and Ponsonby. And what happens with Hartley and Ponsonby is we have a situation whereby more than half the crew have now gone. So more than half the crew have gone. And the captain has said, I will pay all of the crew that's gone AWOL. All of their salary will be paid to the existing skeleton crew if you manage to get the boat home. The skeleton crew, obviously being on a diet. So the skeleton crew, they say, yes, we're happy with that. They get the boat back home and then the captain doesn't want to pay them the bonus. The courts disagree because what they say is the crew's duties were based on a full, full complement of members of the crew. It's now less than half. Therefore, they, they performed above and beyond their normal existing duties. Therefore, the captain did have to pay. Now, I don't know exactly what percentage of crew have to leave the ship before this becomes um, actual proper consideration or it's insufficient consideration. That's a question for the courts. But that's, that's the real issue. Or the other issue is if both parties derive a benefit where the benefits that both parties derive will be from something that the other party has done, there's no duress or fraud because if there is duress or fraud, then that consideration would not be adequate at all. And what happens is within Williams and Roffey, we have a situation whereby a contractor is performing some work for Roffey. Um, Roffey isn't sure whether or not they're going to be able to get the work done on time. They understand that Williams is now in trouble and they agree to pay Williams an extra £10,300 if they get the work done on time. Williams then ends up having to hire extra contractors to make sure the work will be done on time. And because they've actually engaged extra contractors, the courts say that Williams have actually provided additional consideration, which means that Roffey do have to end up having to pay the extra £10,300. Also, another exception to this is if you have an existing contractual obligation that you can't perform, if you get a third party to do it, then that counts as extra consideration. And what I need you to do here, guys, is just make a little love note here when we start looking at Folks Beer and the Rule and Pennells case, because this is why there's an exception to Folks Beer and the Rule and Pennells case. Illegal acts, yeah, we're never going to be okay with illegal acts, so illegal acts are never going to be allowable. Now, I said we're going to get into Pennell's case and the folks' beer. What we have is, if you have a contract and you have to pay, as a, for instance, £10,000 as your consideration, if you pay £7,000, that is not sufficient. So if you only part pay your debt, that is not sufficient consideration. That's the case of folks' beer, and that's now being extended in the rule in Pennell's case. However, however, there are various different exceptions to this rule. So there are various different exceptions to this rule. Now, the exceptions are, I owe you £10,000, but I've only got £7,000 available. If, if both parties freely agree, so we have a cord, so if both parties freely agree that £7,000 is sufficient, then that's fine. Both parties have to freely agree that this £7,000 is sufficient to pay off the £10,000. I cannot apply economic duress. So I can't say to you, oh, I'm skint, I'll never have the 10000 but I'll give you 7000 now as long as you accept it in full satisfaction. That is not sufficient. That's actually what happened within Folks Beer. And Dr. Folks ended up having to pay Mrs. Beer lots more money. So you must have free accord and agreement to this. This type of satisfaction will come about, so this type of additional satisfaction, which is where the extra element of consideration kicks in. This extra consideration, this extra satisfaction comes about because, number one, payment is made in other than cash. Instead of giving you £7,000 in cash, I give you £7,000 worth of CDs. Payment is made before the due date, so instead of paying you at the end of the month, I pay you earlier. That may give you extra benefit. Payment is made not in the middle of the town where we've been doing our deals, but maybe overseas when you're on holiday. You get extra benefit there as well. Payment made by a third party. That's important. So if payment is made by a third party, that now means the third party payment is the extra consideration that I'm giving you. And then we've got the equitable doctrine of promissory estoppel. Now, as soon as I start talking about any type of equitable doctrine, it means I'm looking at fairness. I'm looking at trying to have some sort of equity now, equity basically means fairness. So I'm looking at a fair rule where you're stopped from going back on your promise. That's promissory estoppel. So the doctrine of promissory estoppel is all about stopping you going back on your promises. 
And what happens with CLP, Central London Property and High Trees, is High Trees are actually renting out property from Central London Property and then renting on to other people in London. Unfortunately, the Second World War breaks out. Rental values obviously drop quite significantly. High Trees says to some Central London Property, is it possible that you'd be prepared to reduce your rents? And Central London Property say, not a problem, we'll drop your rents because we know what the problem it is. They drop their rents and then on that basis, high trees carry on acting as though the rents that they will be charged is lower. They pass on the benefits to all of their tenants. Central London property, they're not happy with this. After the Second World War finishes, they then take action against high trees. Their action is for the excess rent that hasn't been paid. It fails. And it fails because of this doctrine of promissory estoppel. And the doctrine of promissory estoppel was said to apply here specifically because of these three reasons. Both parties had agreed to accept part payment in full and final settlement. So Central London Property have said, we're happy for you to pay the lower levels. The creditor intends that the debtor will rely on the agreement. So both parties said, yes, we're happy with this. And then what happened was High Trees acted in reliance of that agreement. So they acted in reliance of that agreement. That's really important to me as well. Now, coming back to the rule in Pennell's case, because this is this doctrine of promissory estoppel is one of the exceptions to the rule in Pennell's case. What I also need to make sure you're happy with is the idea of part payment being an exception. Part payment, so part payment, if it's made by a third party, so part payment, if it's made by a third party, is sufficient consideration because the third party is giving you the act of forbearance. So there's the extra element of consideration. If you have a composition with your creditors, then there's agreement between debtors and creditors with regard to the creditors agree to accept less than actually owed to them, then it becomes legally binding because of the promissory estoppel issue. Cross-reference that with chapter number 11 when we start looking at involuntary or, uh, individual voluntary arrangements with regard to creditor agreements. Now, that's the idea of getting my contract set up. So I've got offer, acceptance, intention, consideration. Next, what I need to do is talk to you about the contents of the contract. And we're going to, this, this is basically my springboard into, into chapter number two. So terms and conditions form part of chapter number one. But when you start to breach them, that's when we get into chapter number two. The terms of the contract will be set out within the offer. They may be negotiated between the offeror and then the offeree to work out exactly what's going on. But what we have is various different sources of these terms. We have what's known as express sources or express terms and conditions. Express terms and conditions are the agreement that the two parties have actually come to. So that's what we have actually agreed to do. You then also have implied terms and conditions. And these implied terms and conditions will come about because of statutory issues and these statutory issues tend to protect consumers when they're dealing with businesses. So they will tend to protect consumers when they're dealing with businesses. And then what we also have is implied terms which come from the courts. So the courts will look at things such as past dealings and then also custom in certain areas to see what type of terms should be implied into the contract. Now, we're going to go through some of these issues in a little bit more detail. So we'll start off by looking at express terms. Express terms are the things that we actually physically agree to between each other. Such terms can be written, they can be oral, they can be a mixture of anything, but they must be, must be clear. So they must be clear. With Scammell and Houston, what happens is Houston's bought a lorry from Scammell on the understanding that the balance of um, the amount of higher purchase has to be paid over a period and that period will be two years. The terms were never supplied so no agreement could be made therefore the amount had to be paid immediately. It's just unfortunate. Express terms, so express terms have to include things such as payment details. Express terms will also have the ability, so they'll have the ability to override implied terms however certain statutory consumer protection mechanisms, so certain statutory consumer protection mechanisms, such as SOGA, the Sale of Goods Act, they can never be overridden. They will always be implied. Now, this allows me to start talking about implied terms in a little bit more detail. With implied terms, 
these types of terms are specifically not included, not included within the contract, but they will be included by the courts when the courts come to look at them. They may have to be included because of the nature of the contract, or they may have to be included to ensure that the business contract can be fulfilled. So the idea of business efficacy is very important to me, and the courts will look at what type of terms and conditions you've had in the past to determine what type of implied terms we should include now. So when we're looking at this from a court's perspective to determine whether or not we should include these implied terms, we will have a look at the surrounding facts. We'll have a look at the legal nature of the contract. We also look at statutory issues and we also look at customs in that area and previous dealings. There's a great case which is known as Hillis and Arcos where somebody's agreed to sell a fair specification of wood. A fair specification is, is ambiguous and vague. However, that ambiguity was removed based on previous dealings because it actually stated beforehand what a fair specification would be. Therefore, you don't have to keep on restating these things over and over and over again. Now, most contracts, so most contracts in the commercial world will be in writing. However, it's possible to have contracts which are not in writing. So it's possible to have contracts which are not going to be in writing. Remember, the contract will come about because of offer and acceptance, intention and consideration. The courts will look at what you have said and what you have done. So this brings us all the way back to the very, very beginning of this chapter. We're looking at what you have done as being really important. Now, one of the last things we're going to look at within this chapter is the doctrine of privity of contract. And what this now means is, if the two parties are engaging in a contract, then the contractual obligations are formed between those two parties only. It also means that only those two people can take action within that contract. And it also means that nobody else can take action within that contract. So only a party who's actually engaged in the contract can take action within the contract. That's the doctrine of privity of contract. And that's from Dunlop and Selfridge again. Again, it's one of these really, really good cases which looked at contract in a huge amount of detail. Unfortunately, we have some exceptions. And the exceptions are, and this is bringing me up to the very, very tail end of the chapter, guys. So stay awake for another couple of minutes and I'm good. So there are a couple of exceptions. If you have a situation whereby there has been a car crash, you do not want to deal with the other party's insurance company and the other party doesn't want to deal with your insurance company you can offload that communication and let the two insurance companies deal together. If you have a principal and agent relationship, and that's in bold because we've got an entire chapter on agency issues, which is really important. So I don't want to go into too much detail here because you've got an entire chapter on it. If you have a special relationship which exists between the two parties, such as acting as an executor of a deceased person's estate, and you were related to that deceased person, We've actually got a case there with Williams and Williams, which you don't need to know about for this, this, this course, unfortunately. If you have collateral or what's known as secondary contracts, so a collateral or a secondary contract, other parties may be able to get engaged in that. Assignment of a benefit, so selling the benefit to somebody else, allows somebody else to get involved. Uh, rights of third parties within the Contract Right of Third Party Act. Trust law, you don't need to know about trust law. So you don't need to know about trust law. When you come to your second year paper, business planning tax, we touch a little bit on trusts. That's about it. And land law, you don't need to know much about land law. All we do is we touch on a very, very small area of the law, which is all about commercial law. Land law is a huge piece of the law and we don't go near it. Now, hopefully that has all made sense to you. I appreciate this is the first chapter you've got into. This is by far and away the longest chapter that you'll have to look at. With other chapters where things start getting a little bit too big, I've broken them down into two areas, so parts one and part two. With this chapter, I just feel it flows really nicely. And I know you're going to be really, really keen to get involved, so I thought the first chapter can be a little bit longer than most of the rest. Thank you very much for your time and attention, guys. Make sure you have a go at the end of chapter questions to make sure you cement all of this knowledge. And I'll see you all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed on chapter two very soon.